So we are now on the winter quarter, 2023-2024, and the book we're covering the winter quarter will be the Psalms. First lesson is called the Res Respect for the Lord and His Will, and we're covering Psalms 1 through 8, 1, 2, 3, and 8 in uh, relative detail, and the rest as an overview. So, Lord, we do we thank you for the Gospel of Mark, which we just finished. It showed that Jesus has come and has paid for our sins. And now we uh, look at this book of or book of prayers mainly. And so, we thank you for this book of prayers and pray that it would be a prompt us to pray in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name, Amen. So we're in the Psalms today, Psalm 1, and uh, the first section that we're looking at is called The Way of the Righteous, Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, and this is uh, our memory verse from a couple of months ago, if anyone remembers that. Yeah, we're getting a new memory verse today. So, so anyway... Um, the first section is uh, just section one, th uh, verses one through three. Somebody want to read that? So yeah, how would you define the word blessed? It says, "How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked." When you hear that you're blessed, what are you? You're glad. Yeah, you're glad. Uh, blessed means fully satisfied. Fully satisfied. So, how blessed is the man? And then it tells uh, how he how he gets that way. He walks not in the counsel of the wicked. So, what are some examples of not walking in the counsel of the wicked? What does the wicked tell you to do? Okay, yeah. Yeah, the wicked may tell you, oh, you, you can cheat to get ahead. It's okay to do that. You know, maybe you can lie to get ahead. It's okay to do that. Um, you know, cheat on your taxes. Nobody's going to catch you. That sort of thing. So this man does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So the wicked may tell him these things, but he does not listen to them. Or stand in the path of sinners. Now, what is the difference between standing in the path of sinners and not walking in the counsel of the wicked? Not standing in the path of sinners. It's kind of a progression, isn't it? The progression of sinfulness. The counsel of the wicked or standing in the path of sinners, and this is from the quarterly, that it talks of adopting the values and habits of unbelievers. So if you have the habits of unbelievers, you may use coarse speech. Uh, you may use uh, drugs or alcohol routinely. You may have a poor work ethic just by habit. So that is standing in the path of sinners. So then sitting in the seat of scoffers, this this man does not sit in the seat of scoffers. And what what do you think of when you think of scoffers? Unkind. Scoffers are unkind. Yeah. Yeah, they belittle the truth, don't they? Uh, scoffers, uh, I think, goes to worldview. You know, you can find scoffers in university, on university campuses. Scoffers. And they're evolutionists. Those are scoffers. Okay. When they, they belittle people because we believe in a young earth. It's true. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, if the, and if you maintain that and say, well, the Bible's record of the origins and the flood is true, you are mocked. So another one is uh, homosexual propaganda. 
if you say that homosexuality is wrong, you are mocked and uh, at attacked, really, attacked as being a bigot. Um, Marxism, of course, you know, our, our country is turning to Marxism at a very rapid rate. Yeah. 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 And so these are, these are the scoffers. But this man does not sit in the seat of scoffers. But instead, his delight is in the law of the Lord. So how do you delight in the law of the Lord? The first thing is you have to read it, don't you? Yeah, if you delight in the law of the Lord, you will read it. And I would say every Christian should read through the Bible once a year. People who teach the Bible should read in it more than once a year. But um, it, it changes your thinking processes when you read it. And then, so his delight in his, is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. That word meditate in the Hebrew means to mumble. To mumble. Now, when, when do you mumble the Bible? I know when I mumble it. Yeah. Okay. In prayer, yeah. Or as you're trying to memorize it. As you're trying to memorize it, you mumble, don't you? <laughs> you, you say it lowly under your breath. You're trying to memorize it. And, you know, Dane has started a memory verse program for us which I have found very awesome. And uh, we do a new one once a month. And we'll, we'll add a new one that, for the month of December today. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the, one, of the, one of the Psalms says, I hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, right? So, and Romans 12 tells us that our mind should be transformed by the word of God. So this psalm speaks of this of this man doing this perfectly. Is there such a man who has done this perfectly? Yeah, he's the only one. Jesus is the only one. So how about you before your salvation? You didn't do that. You know, I was I was a young kid. At my salvation, uh, and I didn't get a Bible for several for years after that that I'm aware of. I might might have gotten one and not been aware of it. How about after salvation? So before salvation, you don't care about this stuff. Right? You don't care about the Bible. You don't care. You don't care. You just don't care. Now after your salvation, there's a there's a variable response to the Bible. Some people are very interested. Some people are less so. Um, but that is how you grow. So it is possible to do this with the Holy Spirit once you're saved. Yeah, and you know there are false teachers in the church too, and they they can they can mislead you. It depends on what church you're going to. Um, if you go to, a, say, a Reformed church or a Catholic church, all the prophecies will seem to be gobbledygook because it doesn't make sense. Because they, spirit. Yeah, you know, I I was a saved person, but I didn't really start to follow the Lord till I was about thirty-five, and then I became very interested in the Bible, and uh, began to read it a lot, and that causes you to grow. Um, but before that, I was just like any pagan, you know, even though I was saved. So, but it is possible. Now, you can't do it like Jesus did, because Jesus never messed up, ever. You know, he did this consistently, continuously from all his life. And, uh, but you can approximate that as you submit to the Holy Spirit as a disciple. And then verse 3, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. So 
When you see the word like, you know it's a simile there. It is similar to a tree planted by the water. What does a tree planted by the water do? It grows. What happens when there's a drought? Yeah, if it's by the water, though, it is protected from the drought, right? If it's by an irrigation ditch, for example, that's what the quarterly used. Um, even though it's going to be a drought around, the, the tree planted by the water will continue to grow, and it will yield its fruit in its season. What is our fruit? What is our fruit? Yeah. Do we have fruit? Our fruit of the Spirit, yeah. Our fruit of the Spirit. The, you know, As we read God's Word, we are moved to do certain things and to stop doing other things. We're moved to pr we're moved to prayer. The natural man thinks prayer is a waste of time. Um, you know, we're moved to attend a church where the natural man would rather sleep in and or watch football or something like that. You know, um, and the the Bible guides you in many ways. So, and that is fruit because as we believe what it says. We act on that faith, and that produces fruit. And it's actually Jesus producing that fruit through us. Okay, so that sounds like good stuff, doesn't it? So now we'll go on to section B, which is the way of the wicked. I'll read that one. That's the next three verses. The wicked are not so but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. That's pretty cut and dried, isn't it? So verse 4, the wicked are not so, so not so what? They're not like this tree. The wicked are planted away from the irrigation ditch. So when drought comes, drought always comes, right? Metaphorically speaking, to everybody's life, you know, th things get rough. And uh, the wicked, of course, they don't have any fruit anyway. But they lose it completely when... The wind comes. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. What judgments will the wicked have? They'll have a judgment of their works. Yes. Heaven and hell is decided based on your reception of or failure to receive Jesus. Once that is decided, so for for us, that has already been decided. Judgment has already occurred. It occurred on Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. For our sins, we will have an, a judgment, but it will be based on our fruit that we allowed God to produce in us. But the wicked, you know, if if the wicked are living at the end of the tribulation, they will be judged, and they will be judged again for whether or not they believe. So there'll be a judgment of the Jews in the wilderness, living Jews at the end of the tribulation when Jesus comes back. If they believe, they go into the millennium alive. If they do not believe, the king, Jesus, will execute them and they'll go to Hades and await their second judgment, which is the great white throne judgment. The Gentiles, that's the sheep and the goat judgment. So at the end of the millennium, and not at the end of the millennium, at the end of the tribulation, there will be a judgment. Do you believe in Jesus or not? If you believe in Jesus, at the end of the tribulation, you go into the kingdom as a mortal. And if you don't, 
King Jesus will send you to the executioner. And you'll go to Hades. That's where you wait for the great white throne. So that is, and you're judged then at the great white throne by your works. And the only works that matter are sin, sinful works. Because you, you know, the thing that mattered, do you believe in Jesus or not, you chose not to. So that's a sad place to be. That's why we are persistent in evangelizing the lost, because we don't want anyone to end up in that spot. So the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, and that, is, that will really be true in the millennium, the beginning of the millennium. The sinners will not be in the assembly of the righteous because they'll be executed, and they'll end up in Hades. But as the millennium goes on, the mortals will marry and have children, and then those children will have to decide about Jesus. You know, that's the most important decision anyone has to make, is what about Jesus? <laughs> what do you do with him? Um, it makes a big difference as far as your future. Okay, and that is Psalm 1. Anything else about Psalm 1? We have Psalm 1 half memorized now, right? Since we, that was our memory verse. We have the good part of it memorized. <laughs> we ignored the other part. Okay, so section C is the Lord installs a king. Can somebody read verses 1 through 6 of Psalm 2? That's the end. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the the commentaries talk about these two psalms being a, a piece, you know, being like together. So Jesus is the perfect man who is blessed because he uniformly delights in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he does not go along with uh, sinful influences. And because of that, he will be raised to kingship. We can't be like Jesus, but we can approximate Jesus' character as we grow spiritually, you know. Yes, as we learn to let the Holy Spirit lead and we follow the Holy Spirit. And um, and that is taking up your cross, really. You allow the Holy Spirit to lead. Because you might have an idea, I want to do this, I want to go over here. And the Holy Spirit says, I'd rather you do this. So that is your cross when you say, okay, I will give up what I was planning on, and I will do what you desire. That is the hard part. That's the training yeah. process. The yeah. training process. I'm working on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that's what all of us do, you know. And uh, as you as you do that, as you have experience with it, you realize that he does know better. Yeah. It will turn out better if you listen. Yeah. So, um, but the... You know, the wicked in in Psalm 1, verse 4, are equated to verse 1 of Psalm 2. The nations are in an uproar, and the peoples devise a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together, together against the Lord and against his anointed. They are the wicked. You know, when I think of verse 2, the kings of the earth take their stand. I think of the Great Reset. Everybody heard of the Great Reset? Yeah, from the World Economic Forum. That is like the, that is like this. Take their stand. The rulers take counsel again, together against the Lord and against His anointed. All of their doctrines are against biblical truth. Yeah, own nothing and be happy, right. That is not biblical. So I have written down here, 
Ephesians 4. And as, as usual, I don't remember why I did it. You know, yeah, it is possible for believers to act like unbelievers and take your stand against the Lord and against his anointed. And that is why we are told as believers in the church to do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So that means if we're told not to do that, it means we can do it. But let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So yeah, it, just because we're saved doesn't mean we can't grieve the Holy Spirit. We can. And that's from going back to the flesh and just doing what we feel like. And what men tend to do is in verse 3, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. They tend to overestimate their own strength. That's what Peter did when he told the Lord, I will never, you know, denounce you. I will never forsake you or betray you. And the, he said, well, <laughs> you're going to do it three times, buddy. You know, before the night's out, you're going to do it three times. Peter said, oh, no, no, you know, because we think our flesh is stronger than it is. Our flesh is not strong. Our flesh gives up real quick. And uh, so if you're in the flesh, you will crumple. And that's why you make these false boasts. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Well, you know, I mean, this is God we're talking about. What are you going to do against him? You know, nothing. So we don't want to overestimate our own strength. And, you know, I would say when the Lord gives you a, a challenge and the challenge looks too big for you, that's probably an accurate assessment. But if the Lord asks you to do it, then he'll help you. If you pray, if you ask him, ask him to help you. You know, if he wants you to do it, he will help you to do it. He will bring help alongside you to do it. So, and that's where prayer comes in, and we ask for him to help us. But the Lord's going to do what he wants, no matter how much people whine and cry and go against him. Um, and verse 4 is his attitude toward those who tell God no. He sits in the heavens and laughs. You know, tell God no sometime, and what is he going to do? <laughs> He'll laugh at you. So we don't want to, to go against him. And then, and we really don't want, verse 5, he will speak to him in his anger and terrify them in his fury. I do not want to be on God's bad side. You know, for us, those of us who believe in Jesus, his bad side is discipline. Um, he doesn't destroy us. But he will make it hurt. You know, if we need it, if we need a, a spanking, he he knows how to give a spanking. That that hurts. Okay, any more about that? Now this psalm here, it's Psalm two. Is there's no author to it. But we know from Acts 4, verse 25, that David was the author. Because in Acts 4, 25, and it's Peter speaking, it's Peter giving a sermon, attributes this psalm to David. So that's just a little tidbit. Okay, so I'll go ahead and read verses 7 through 12 of Psalm 2. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, 
and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Verse 7, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. So what day is he speaking of? Who is this psalm talking of? Yeah, it has to be Jesus, right? Because, well, verse 8, I will give the nations as your inheritance in the very ends of the earth. So we also know from that that that's still yet future, right? Because that has not happened yet. That a king appointed by God has ruled over the entire earth. That has not happened yet. You know, David was appointed by God, but he didn't rule over the entire earth. Solomon was appointed by God, etc. But they did not rule over the entire earth. So this is yet future. And so this has to be Jesus. So when was Jesus begotten? You are my son, today I have begotten you. As God, was he ever begotten? As God? No. He is eternally existent, right? Second member of the Trinity. There is no time when he was not. He is eternally existent. But at some point in time, he added something. He added humanity, right? He was begotten as a human, as a man. So that's what he's speaking of. He's speaking of his incarnation. Um, the second member of the Trinity did not lose anything. He did not exchange anything, any of his qualities, any of his attributes. He added humanity to deity. And that's called the hypostatic union in theological terms. And, you know, that is a doctrine, Christian doctrine, for thousands of years. Jesus is fully God, and he is fully man. And he is fully man like other men, except for the fact that he does not have a sin nature like we do. Uh, because he is, he was, his father was the Holy <laughs> Holy Spirit, you know, and not God. The sin nature is passed down in the sperm. Yeah, through the through the father, Adam, you know, our father, the father of all of us is Adam. Uh, the father of Jesus is not Adam. And so he does not have a sin nature. We are born with a sin nature because Adam is our daddy. Okay, I get it. Yeah, and we are born with the attributes of our father. You know, yeah. That is original sin. That's original sin. So, uh, and you know, when kids are born, they're innocent, but... Before they last too long, they sin themselves. <laughs> they, I mean, <laughs> maybe it lasts, you know, like three three hours. Maybe they can last without sinning. But because because what happens when you're born? You are totally self-aggrandizing, right? Nothing matters but you when you're born. That that's how people are born, you know, and. Uh, that's what the parent's job is to beat that out of their kids over years. My dad, um, and I get attention. And I get, I get what I want, yeah. I, I mean, all of us as parents, you know, have come up with different things. We used to love putting our kids, you know, you put them in, the, in this little seat that had wheels. Mm -hmm. yeah. We put them in a seat with the, that had wheels. We turn on the TV, and it was uh, 
baby Einstein, and it played Mozart and had little yeah. blocks and stuff, and they it would mesmerize them, yeah. and they would be yeah. paralyzed for a while. <laughs> yeah, we all devise methods to yeah. calm calm the kids <laughs> down. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, in verse 8, right, no Jewish king has ever controlled the entire earth. So we know that that is yet coming. It's prophetic. And verse 9 is the tenor of his rule. It says, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. So what does that tell us about Jesus' rule? It, it sounds strict, doesn't it? It sounds very strict. So he's going to rule with a rod of iron. You know, I don't think there will be any appellate courts. There may be courts. You and I will be maybe judges in the courts, and there will be no appeals to our decisions. And the sentence will be carried out immediately. You know, now it goes for years, you know, especially like a death penalty case. It'll go for years and years and years. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, without the sentence ever being carried out. Well, I think we are learning it now. But when we're there, we'll be perfected. And we'll have the mind of Christ perfectly. Because remember, when we're resurrected, our sin nature is removed from our body. Our resurrection body is our body without the sin nature. And so it will last eternally. And so we won't be fighting. Right now we're fighting ourselves every, every day. Because we have a sin nature and it's always... Clamoring for attention. Yes, we're yes. Exactly. exactly. And yeah. so right now we're training to control that yes. <laughs> by leaning on the Lord moment by moment, you know. And and when we're tempted to sin, we need to learn to reckon ourselves dead to sin, which means we don't have to respond. We're not forced to respond like we were before. And we present ourselves to the Lord to do what he would like. That, and that, that's a day-by-day -day process of training. But when we get there, say, for example, Mark, right now, does not have a sin nature. It's gone. Because it, it resides in our body. And, and uh, so he doesn't have to deal with that anymore. And when he is resurrected, then that body will not fight him. Like ours fights us. Yeah. You know, well, I don't know about that. But, <laughs> yeah, I think we'll know much more. But I think we'll, there will probably still be mysteries even then because God is infinite. So, but anyway, uh, justice will be perfect. It will be very quick. And, uh and so there won't be any temptation to sin, really. You know, very little temptation to sin. The only temptation will be the, the flesh of people born in the millennium. The devil will not be there to tempt. He'll be bound in the abyss during the millennium. So the devil cannot tempt you. His demons cannot tempt you. The only thing that can tempt you is you yourself. And you'll have, and Jesus will be known everywhere because he'll be sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. It will be very peaceful. Yeah. Yeah. Very peaceful. Yeah. And any infractions of law will be dealt with with a rod of iron. Very quick, very stern. So, verse 10. Now, therefore, O king, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth. So other kings have a choice. They can take the warning and choose wisely and 
put their trust in Jesus. And that, again, will be at the sheep and goat judgment. Sheep and goat judgment is found in Matthew 25, uh, verses 31 through 46. And it's very simple. Did you believe in Jesus or not? And in this, it will be evident that you believed in Jesus during the tribulation period if you helped the Jews. That is not what saves you, helping the Jews, but that's uh, an indication that you have been saved. So verse Matthew 25, verse 46 says, These will go away into eternal punishment. And who are these? These are the goats, the ones who did not help the Jews during the tribulation, but the righteous, those who did help the Jews, into eternal life. Verse 11 says, Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do we revere the Lord? Worship the Lord with reverence. Do we revere the Lord? Yeah, we want to revere the Lord. This made me think of a saying from the Chronicles of Nar Narnia. C.S. Lewis, you know, children's books. I think it's from the first, from the first one, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Speaking of Aslan, remember Aslan is supposed to be Jesus. Aslan is the lion. Did you ever read the Chronicles of Narnia? No? Okay. It's, it's really good. It's really, it's a fairy tale. And, uh, so speaking of Aslan, one of the one of the people said, he is not safe. They're asking him, is he safe? Aslan said, he is not safe, but he is good. And Jesus is that way. He is not safe. He is dangerous. He is all powerful. Yeah. So that's why I, that made me a. Think about that, verse 11. Worship the Lord with reverence. Rejoice with trembling. Yeah. You know, because he, like, hums with power, you know. And just like you coming up on a transformer, you're careful <laughs> with it, you know. Now, Jesus is not going to go off on you without reason. But he can go off on you, and he's very powerful. So that you want to be reverent toward him. So verse 12, do homage to the Son that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. So that kind of goes along with verse 11. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. So he who has the Son has the Father also. Learn that from 1 John. <clears throat> so I want to look at Psalm 8 real quick. If we have time, we'll look at the psalms in between. This also is the psalm of David. Let's see if you recognize this. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's a song. You have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes through the paths of the seas, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So what is this psalm telling us? What is it telling us about man? Yeah, so this is goes against the um, thought processes of the scoffers from Psalm 1, right? The evolutionists who say that we're, uh, we have evolved from uh, amoeba, right? Through monkey to human, you know, and that we're no different. 
you know, this goes against this uh, this uh, kind of animal worship that puts uh, all animals on a pedestal with people, you know, and say that animals are just as important as people. You know, I mean, animals are nice. I, I have cats, and I like them very much. But they are not made in the image of God. They, right, they can't speak. They don't have uh, intellect. I might think they may have emotion. That you know, I see evidence of emotion in in the animals. Yeah, in the kitties. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But they're the you know they're not able to communicate, uh, etc. So they're not on the same uh, level as man. And God did that purposefully to make beings that he could communicate with, he could have relationships with. And so, and yeah, he did make us to rule over the works of his hands. And we gave that away in the Garden of Eden. We gave that ability away. Right. And part of this uh, radical environmental pet movement is that they don't want us eating meat yeah. either because of that, you know. Yeah. And it, that came into being at the flood. That's part of the Noahic covenant that we would, Lord said, okay, you can eat meat. And uh, that covenant is to go on as long as the earth exists. Right now, the United Nations, I don't know if you heard this, this is just recently, they want us to cut down our meat consumption in America. Now, I don't know how they're going to try to do that. So, you know, you, you think weird. When you don't believe the Bible, you think weird. <laughs> yeah. They're, t they're awful tasty. That's right. The steak is awful tasty. Yeah, a good barbecued steak. Yeah, yeah that's right. Exactly. You gotta eat it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, I will let you read the the psalms in between now that we skipped. So, the, this is going to go like this the whole time. We're going to end up skipping a whole bunch of psalms. But so, Lord, we thank you for these uh, psalms. We thank you that you have made us in your image. We thank you that we're able to communicate with you. We do pray that you would help us to worship you in reverence, um, because you deserve it. So we pray for our service that you would be honored. In Jesus' name, amen.